I want you to just share, Lee, a little bit about your family, where you live. Um, talk a little bit about uh, Connor. Well, first of all, you got a big banquet coming up, and no matter how good a job we do today, let Bobby Clampett think that he did a better job. All right? <laughs> It'll be important to him. <laughs> so, but my family, um, my son's 21. Right now he's in London, uh, second semester in junior. He goes to Rollins, but he is spending one semester abroad. Uh, I would say that my son is a great example of God's grace that in spite of my parenting, he has turned out awesome. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. So, uh, you and Bev live where? We live in Orlando. We have um, lived, we've been married 25 years. We just had a 25th anniversary last year mm. and had a great trip to Mexico, something that um, we wish we'd done more of over the years. But when you have kids and you travel a lot, sometimes those things don't work out. But mm. anyway, um, we've been in the Orlando area since 1992. Just talk about how you came into golf. Right. I don't think that I would have ever gotten into golf had we not moved to Florida. When we lived in Westminster, Maryland, there was only a nine-hole golf course <laughs> at the local college, and it was basically an executive course. Um, I went back there and played in college uh, to visit the friend, my next-door neighbor, and when I played the course, the first hole I hit a three-wood over the green. That was par four. <laughs> so it, I don't think it was quite the challenge that it would have been to hone someone's game growing up. So we moved to Florida when I was 12. My dad was so excited that he could join a country club for the first time in a while. Um, and that's basically the, the first summer we were there, having played baseball during the summer in Maryland. We, uh, the, the school year was when we played baseball in Florida. So the summer was wide open once um, all stars were over and everything. So I got shipped to the golf course early morning to do the clinic. And there were buddies from baseball there. They invited me to play became a daily thing. Um, I, I can't say I was a natural. I was not very good at the start, mm -hmm. but um, I improved rapidly and enjoyed playing. And within a couple of years, I had to make a choice, uh, baseball or golf. And I wasn't growing then either. I was the shortest kid in the league in baseball at 14. And I was improving quite rapidly in golf. So, you know, it was easy choice at that point. Still heart wrenching to give up baseball, but two weeks before college started, after my senior year in high school, I was going to go to Brevard Junior College, and the coach there said I could come and try out, but I probably wasn't going to make the team because he had his team set. Mm -hmm. So this is just two weeks before college started. I really was not organized and uh, thinking ahead very well. I don't even think I had an apartment lined up yet. Um, so I was playing a junior tournament in the area in Lakeland and shot 29 on one of the nines, maybe 30. Um, but it was something I had never done in a junior tournament. And the Florida Southern golf coach right there in Lakeland, I, I think he just assumed I was going somewhere else. Um, he found out that I did not have a place to go, and they still had scholarship money left over. So this is just two weeks before school starts and said, you know, if you can pass any classes, we can get you into school. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily, I had graduated from high school, and I was able to get in at Florida Southern. Um, yeah, talk the last about minute. that, because, uh, and who played on your team? Right. Uh, my freshman year, Florida Southern was two-time defending national champions, and everyone was returning, and Rocco Mediate had just transferred in. <laughs> so they looked pretty good. Uh, Marco Dawson was there also, mm -hmm. and he was a freshman the year before. So that particular year, I didn't play much. Uh, my grades weren't very good. I had to go to summer school the year after my freshman year just to become eligible again. But so, you guys won yeah. the national championship, 85, 86, and how'd you do in 86? Right, so uh, there was a lot for me to learn and a lot of maturing that I needed to do. So I, I straightened out my studies and my grades were good enough and I played in every tournament my sophomore, junior, and senior year. And then our senior year, we won our second straight national championship and I won the individual. You uh, graduate in 86, you join the PGA Tour. How long did it take you to get on? Um, well, 1990 was my rookie year. Tour school is the year before, so a little over three years of traveling in my car and putting, you know, 100,000 miles on a couple different cars and living out of my car and staying wherever. Um, yeah, but it was my wife and I, we look back at those as great times. Uh, we met a lot of friends that were trying to do the same thing, and they're still our friends today. 
and uh, it was it was a great lesson for us to look back and say you know the the money really wasn't important it was the you know the journey that was really all that mattered you know we look back at that with great memories um, and when I got on tour in 1990 um, you know it's it was a long hard journey to get there but all of it was great building character and what I needed to learn to once I got on tour to stay there I had forgotten that uh, Gordon Brewer talked about how he was uh, yelling at you as you were heading back to the uh, tee box uh, at number five. Tell us what happened on number five, because you talked about from five on, what happened to five? Right. Well, the, the first few holes were all a struggle, um, and I was a little antsy starting out. I bogey two and three, I birdie four, and so I thought things turned around. Fifth hole at Olympic is the absolutely the hardest driving hole on the course for me. Uh, the hole bends left to right, and the fairway slopes away to the left, so you've, you basically have to hit a fade off the tee or hit something really short off the tee and then have a super long shot to the green. Um, fade is not the shot that I want to hit off the tee. Um, and I had trouble with that tee shot earlier in the week too. So anyway, I pushed my tee shot into the trees. The trees in, at the Olympic Club are very thick. So we started off the tee. Uh, a marshal came up the fairway and said, I watched it all the way. It said it didn't come out of the tree. So we'd only walked maybe 60 or 70 yards. I stopped. I just told my caddy, I said, you go down there and start looking. I'll go back and hit a provisional. Um, what I didn't know about the rules was if I had hit that second tee ball, it would have been in play. Because once you leave the teeing ground and you go back and hit another one, it's in play. That's just the way it is. So before I ever got back to the tee, the ball fell out of the tree. So it was there <laughs> a minute or so, I guess you could say, um, but before my caddy even got down there. Uh, so that is a relief right there because that being the hardest hole in the course, I was looking at double or more. Uh, so now I didn't, I didn't have a very easy chip out really. I had to get it under a tree, over the rough, and then stop it on a fairway that was going away. And I hit it just barely through the fairway on the other side, hit a six iron on the back of the green in the, in the fringe, and then chipped in for par. Um, so walking off that hole, I felt great about what just transpired. You know, had the ball just gone straight into the rough off the tee, you know, I, I would have known I was in trouble. but the whole way everything transpired that the ball stayed in the tree and then I thought of making a seven and all of a sudden I don't, you know, I have a chance now to make a five and then walked out with four. Um, th that all worked in my favor. You know, the, it would have been extremely unlucky for the ball to stay in the tree. But as it turns out, it was lucky that it stayed in the tree just for a short time and then fell out. Funniest event that's happened to you on a golf course? I, I should have one story, but there's so many things we laugh at out there. Uh, <laughs> nothing comes to mind nothing right off the bat. You okay. know, we, we try and play tricks on each other, lock each other in bathrooms, uh, <laughs> throw balls at the uh, port of john doors when someone's in there. Yeah, I, I've watched them actually <laughs> fire shots at the port of john when a guy's in there. Yeah. <laughs> you had... Um, uh, a terrific career. You're now on the Champions Tour. Uh, you've only been on for uh, less than a year. Uh, differences that you see? Um, what are you glad to, uh, to be as a part of the Champions Tour? Well, it's like a big club. Um, it's the same group of guys, 81 every week. We all know each other. We all played together on the regular tour for years. Um, I know everybody out there. And one or two guys that have qualified that did not play on the PGA Tour, you get to know them very quickly. Um, so it's, it's just like, a, it's like having a men's fellowship right here. You know, we get together every week and we have tee times that are about two hour window, so we see each other all the time. And I, I would say the competition is very good. I, I just cannot believe that there is another 50 year old set of athletes that perform as close to their peak as golfers do on the Champions Tour. It's uh, really quite amazing what some of the guys have been doing over mm -hmm. the years. Um, and a couple of things I noticed right off the bat on the Champions Tour that's different. Um, we have Porta Johns basically on every other hole, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is good. And, uh, you know, on the regular tour, you walk in and four or five guys might be on the floor and, and they're stretching. If you walk into a Champions Tour locker room and you see four or five guys on the floor, you might call 911. <laughs> <laughs> so. Now that's a big difference. That's, yeah. that's funny. <laughs> and we have readers at the scoring tent. There's three of them at each seat. So when we sign our scorecards, we all have glasses. 
That's a good thing. That's a necessary. Yeah. Let's talk about, uh, I know you love golf, uh, you've excelled at golf, but also uh, you have a great relationship with God. How did that come about? Um, when did you become serious about your faith? What does that mean to you today? Um, 1996, um, I had gone to church as a, as a kid, was in the youth group. Um, once golf took over, or I let golf take over my life basically, um, I wasn't going to church much, but mm -hmm. when we moved um, to Orlando, we started attending church again, and, and I still wrestled with the question every day was, um, I try and live my life as good as I can, but how can I possibly know if I'm living it good enough? Mm. Um, so as a kid, I would go to the youth camps and I always heard the gospel and I would always go to the front on the altar call for Jesus, uh, but I didn't understand what that really meant. And it wasn't until the mid nineties that it finally hit me that there was nothing I could do to earn salvation to go to heaven. Mm. Uh, it's just, I, didn't, I just didn't get it uh, for the longest time. So it was a simple question. How do I ever know I'm gonna make it to heaven? Well, you, you know, it's not up to me. I know you guys were friends, you guys traveled together, you did stuff together. Uh, talk about the fellowship a little bit and what difference that makes to you guys out there. Uh, well, it's good to have the common bond. Um, guys you know, you can have serious conversations with about just about anything. Um, I, I always enjoy those conversations about uh, what, what is happening in your life, what is uh, different, how you're being changed. Uh, anything you do routinely that just helps, and I know you're very disciplined and you take your pills and do all of that, but I know you are in your spiritual uh, life as well. Um, talk a little bit about your routine and your relationship with Christ and how you grow that. Well, um, in my early years, I really was a seeker of truth. Um, I loved reading anything about biblical prophecy, um, just anything I could read to, uh, you know, the truth, the facts, the history of the Bible, why I knew that it was true, um, all of the, you know, any of, the, of that. Um, but, you know, the Bible says that Jesus came true, uh, fully in truth and grace. So while I was on this journey of truth, I was not experiencing the grace as much as I should have, which, you know, the, we know the Pharisees were all about truth and not grace. So, um, you know, once the journey of grace started, I feel like I was being changed even more. Even though I gathered all this information, there were facts and truth. Um, seeing grace work in my own life, uh, things that have changed in my life over the years that I could not have possibly done myself. Um, I, I know having a son that has had a huge impact on me. One, uh, any information or discipline I had to pass to him, I, uh, you know, it made me really look at my own life and say, well, I cannot tell him he can't do this if I'm doing it myself. And um, it just gave me a glimpse of what the relationship between me and God was through my son. Mm. Talk a little bit about, you said that you went to church, you were a good church goer. Um, what was the difference between being involved in religion, <clears throat> excuse me, and having a personal relationship with God? How did that come about and how would anybody have that come about? Well, um, I guess I was under the uh, impression that as long as I went to church, um, I was in good shape. Um, now, yeah, the relationship, you know, there was, when I see the difference in other people's lives, that really makes a difference. You know, right after Payne's death, I was at his house many days in a row and, and met many of the people that, of the church that he was going to, and I could tell there was something different about them. Hmm. Um, so. You know, just going to churches, and I, you know, found out it obviously wasn't enough. I mean, it was just what church you go to might also you want to go somewhere where they are telling the truth, um, where they are experiencing fellowship with each other, where it transforms lives. Uh, college Golf Fellowship is a ministry that you know Larry knows about also, where uh, we've hosted a lot of college kids at our house over the years, and to see those kids interact with each other and transform over just a few short days. Um, I had a huge impact on my family also, just to watch God at work in their lives and the way they uh, interacted. Most of the kids that showed up there had no idea that you could have fun and be a Christian at the same time. <laughs> yeah, you know, laughing being, and a Christian? <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah, they do a great job. Um, they've hosted in their home and let 50 to 60 college kids 
crawl all underneath the dining room table to sleep and uh, all over their place just for the opportunity to share with them what it means to have a personal relationship with God.